Hello, hello. Please do like and subscribe. Artificial intelligence, everyone's talking about at the moment. Um, maybe quite sensationalist. Maybe you're thinking, is it going to take over the world? Is everyone going to lose their jobs? Is misinformation going to take over the public sphere? I want to get to the bottom of this because I don't think a lot of what we're hearing is particularly well informed. So that's why we have Professor Michael Woolridge, who is Woolridge, sorry, <laughs> rude, get his name right. He's the professor of computer science at Oxford University, so knows pretty much everything there is to know about this topic. No, no <laughs> pressure. Uh, thanks for that. Nice to meet you, Owen. Okay, artificial intelligence. What are we even talking about? What does it even mean? Okay. So there is no standard definition of artificial intelligence. Actually, everybody has their own definition and your definition is probably as good as mine. Uh, but actually, for me, what artificial intelligence is all about is simply about getting machines to do things which currently can only be done by human beings, by entities that have brains, nervous systems and bodies. Uh, and we've seen some real progress in AI over the last 10 years, which is why everybody's so excited. Uh, and the progress in AI seems to have speeded up in, in the last couple of years. And for the most part, what we do in AI is we take, we look at some particular task, some particular problem, which currently only people can do, and we try to get machines to be able to do that. And usually what we do is we focus on very, very specific tasks, like recognizing a face in a a face in a picture or being able to translate from one language to another or to drive a car, uh, for, to have a computer drive a car. And each of these is one individual problem uh, that we try to get uh, that, that we try to get computers to do. For the most part, AI researchers are not concerned with the Hollywood dream of AI, the idea of having um, machines that are as fully competent as uh, as human beings are, but the machines that can do everything that a human being can do, or maybe uh, maybe more. But we've begun to hear more about that in the last year or two. So jobs, here's something that keeps coming up. Basically, a lot of jobs that are currently done now, and we're talking often jobs that might even be seen as quite I guess, middle-class professional jobs, that kind of thing, they're all going to get taken over by AI. How much do you think that is the case? I think certainly think some jobs are, are are threatened. That's for sure. I mean, at some point in the future, driverless car technology will work. And when driverless car technology really works on a large scale uh, and is really, really trusted and reliable, and we're not there yet. I mean, the standard joke is, you know, it's imminent and it's been imminent for a while. Um, but when that technology really works, then that's going to threaten a, a large number of jobs. I mean, I think there's a statistic in the United States. There are 3.5 million truck drivers in the United States and hundreds of thousands of taxi drivers. Um, so those jobs are potentially threatened. For the vast majority of people, I think the way that they're going to experience AI is it's just going to be another tool in their working lives and the way that computers are tools that we all encounter. You know, word processors did not make uh, secretaries redundant or personal assistants redundant. They just made them more efficient. Um, so I think for, for most people, the way that they're going to encounter AI is just as part of their working lives, another tool that they use, not necessarily replacing them. ChatGPT. Everyone's talking about ChatGPT at the moment. So what do you think about that? And also, how dangerous is it? Because it can just, you know, potentially, I don't know, from everything from university students getting it to write their essays for them, or even, even journalists getting it to, them to write copy for them. I mean, how much could, chat, you know, that kind of thing? What do you think about ChatGPT generally and, and the kind of fears about ChatGPT? Chat well, ChatGPT is very impressive technology, and it's it's a class of systems called large language models, which have really only really only appeared over the last few years. And what ChatGPT does is something which actually sounds really quite silly. Um, what it does is basically what your smartphone does uh, when you start typing a, a text message. If you if I open up my smartphone and I start typing a text message to my wife and I type "I'm going to be," it will my my smartphone will suggest a completion, and the completion might be in the pub or late or, or late and in the pub. And the way that it's doing that is it's looked at all my text messages and it's seen that the likeliest next words after I type I'm going to be are either going to be late or in the pub. So chat GPT and these other large language models, they do exactly the same thing. It's actually quite important to emphasize that. They literally do exactly the same thing, except that 
the text that they've been trained on in order to be able to do that is not just the smartphone messages, smartphone messages, the text messages on your smartphone, but all of the text that's available in digital form in the world. The entirety of the World Wide Web is typically downloaded and fed to these large language models in order that they can be able to do this predicting what's going to come next in a, in a, a given a piece of text, given a prompt. And it turns out that um, given uh, enough processing power and it requires AI supercomputers running for months in order to be able to, uh, to build these large language models and given enough data, you know, the entirety of the World Wide Web to begin with, uh, that actually Firstly, the chat GPT and, and they're like, they produce very, very plausible sounding text. That's the whole point of giving them all of that text is to be able to produce very plausible sounding text. But they also acquire in ways that we don't quite understand. They also acquire some other skills. So, for example, they can nicely summarize text or extract the key points from text or compare two different pieces of text for commonalities and differences. And those are incredibly useful things to be able to do uh, in our jobs. And fundamentally, that's what uh, these tools like these systems like ChatGPT and so on are, are, are really good at. What's so interesting, I think, about these is, you know, the press has been full of stories around AI for a decade at least now. It's been big news for a decade at least. Um, but for most people, it hasn't entered their lives in any way. I mean, it hasn't impacted them in any in any real sense. But now anybody with a web browser and Internet access anywhere in the world can now have access to the, the most sophisticated AI technology in the world. They can get their hands on it. And it's it's very impressive when you use it. It's hard not to be dazzled the first time you use it. You have very natural sounding interactions. You just type ordinary questions and it comes back with very ordinary, normal sounding answers. And it, it seems very knowledgeable, although you know we might talk about this later, but it gets things wrong a lot. But you can ask it questions about, uh, you know, uh, the life of uh, the life of Caesar, or the chief of key chief, key achievements of Winston Churchill, or uh, how to synthesize, uh, you know, how to synthesize a particular drug, and so on. You can ask all of this stuff, and it seems to know it all. So it seems very, very, very competent. So now anybody in the world can have access to that, and it feels like the AI that we were promised. It feels like you know, we finally got our hands on something that feels like Star Trek AI. It isn't, uh, but that's how it, it that's how it appears when you start to use it. So, I mean, it, it does it being, a, I mean, because people here are artificial intelligence, so they actually think to themselves, well, there's this, there's actual kind of, in, you know, some form of, we think of human intelligence in those terms. That's what people are thinking about. But it, is it just basically language it's just it's it's got lots of language inputs and it's predict it, it, i mean it is like as you said in a mobile phone you get the prediction based on what you've previously said it's just that just more sophisticated is that that's cool? exactly what it is that's all it is it is just a sophisticated version of that and it is so sophisticated. I mean, the whole point of this is that it's supposed to sound, to come back with very plausible and natural sounding text, and it succeeds in doing that. But it's what it, the, our very natural tendency is to read a lot more into those interactions than is actually there. It's not thinking in any sense. You know, it's not contemplating any meaningful sense in the way that we might contemplate something when we have a conversation or or. or, or, or or, or when we think about something, it is simply trying to come back with what it thinks is the most plausible response. That's absolutely all it's doing. So it's really important if you do use these, and I say it's great fun, you know, so I urge you to, 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 to go and have a go with these. Don't read more into it than is actually there. It is just a glorified autocomplete. But, I mean, in 10 years' time, given where we're at now and the advances we've made, could it just write books which you just give it an input, but books which actually are actually useful, readable books, both nonfiction, but also fiction. I mean, is that actually plausible? Yeah, I, 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 it, that's clearly the direction that we're going. At the moment, the, the limits are 
to do with the length of text. I mean, uh, uh, the, the predecessor to GPT-4, which was announced a few years ago, could, could cope with a couple of pages of text. GPT-4 can cope with something like, you know, 20 pages of text or 20 to 30 pages of text, which is a good size. But that's not the scale of a kind of, you know, of a Harry Potter novel or something like that. And there's there are all sorts of challenges to be overcome before we can get to anything uh, like that. Um, but that's clearly the direction that this is going. Um, would it generate, you know, really interesting, profound novels? I'm not sure that's a terribly interesting use of this technology. I'd rather read novels that were written by human beings. And the answer to this, the, the reason why I would prefer that is that I want to know that the person that wrote this understands what uh, what it's writing about. That when it that, that when it writes about love, it's had some experience of love. When it writes about pain, that it's had some experience of pain. These language models haven't experienced anything. They're actually slightly weird, disembodied things. They don't exist in our world at all, and they've never experienced anything. So, would art created by large language models be more than superficially interesting? And I think it could be superficially interesting. I can think of a million uses for it. You know, and that's not to denigrate the achievements, but but, um, you know, it's hard to see, uh, you know, human artists in particular not having a role. For more mundane texts, you know, instruction manuals and stuff like that, yeah, I think, you know, that's clearly, uh, that's clearly where the technology is going. And, you know, for routine pieces of text, I think, um, you know, the, the AI, generative AI is clearly going to be very widely used uh, within a few years. When you say it gets things wrong, so actually you should always kind of with, have a pinch of salt over some of the things it comes up with. And is is that, but that's like to be rectified as it advances onwards, the technology. Yeah. So the technology gets things wrong and it gets things wrong really, really a lot. Um, and it's got no conception of whether what's true or false. It's not trying to tell you the truth because it doesn't know what the truth is. What it's trying to do is to essentially make the best guess about what the next words should be given your prompt. So if I give it a prompt, say my prompt is um, the key achievements in the life of Winston Churchill, it will come back usually with a, 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 a summary uh, of what it thinks would be the likeliest completion there, the likeliest next bit of text to occur. And it will sound very plausible and very natural. And But you absolutely have to check all of the facts that you're given because it gets things wrong in a very, very plausible way. It tends not to get things wrong in ridiculous and very obvious ways. And this is one of the real dangers of the technology. It gets things wrong in subtle and plausible ways. So if you use it, absolutely, you should be skeptical. You need to check what this thing is telling you. Final things I wanted to just ask you about, which is, I mean, inevitably, slightly cliched kind of questions, which you're more than used to, I'm sure, uh, which is the more sensationalist side of things, which is, I mean, well, I suppose let's go back to Alan Turing, who clearly was a hugely, you know, a huge pioneer uh, who was treated barbarically by the authorities, uh, despite his contribution to the war effort. I and mean, then he had something called, uh, for those who don't know, listening or watching to this, the Turing test, which was a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior similar to that of, or sorry, it, 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 the same as that of a human being and no, nothing's ever passed the Turing test. Do you think anything could pass the Turing test? And could you genuinely, do you think you could ever get sentient um, artificial intelligence and, and what kind of, and if so, what kind of threat could that pose? I suppose? So I think, uh, absolutely, uh, things can pass the Turing test. If we haven't already passed it with large language models, then actually I think we're probably quite close. Um, I think, you know, you, we could argue about the details of the test, and my colleagues do often argue with me about the details of the test. Um, but I think, you know, the text that's produced by chat GPT and GPT-4 and so on is comfortably at the same level as, as, a, as a human being. So I think for, for you know, for practical intents and purposes, as the test is now history. But actually what that flags up is the test really is only evaluating one tiny dimension of intelligence. And human intelligence goes far beyond just linguistic ability, the ability to hold a conversation with, 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 somebody, with somebody else. I mean, I think if we ever have true AI, then that 
AI ought to be capable of the infinite number of things that a human being is capable. You know, it ought to be able to tie a shoelace, ride a bicycle, cook an omelette, invent a, a, a new and convincing joke. It ought to be able to do any of the things that a human being can do. Um, and the Turing test doesn't test that. It just looks at whether the thing can pass itself off in conversation as a human being. So I think, the, you know, for, for all practical intents and purposes, I think we've passed the Turing test at some point very quietly in the last couple of years. But what that's flagging up, although that's significant, is the limitations of the Turing test. So we've got a long way to go, I think, before we get fully realized artificial intelligence. And one of the most important reasons why you know, we, we've still got a long way to go is that ChatGPT and all of its um, siblings don't exist in the physical world. They aren't robots. They can't ride a bicycle or tie a pair of shoelaces. And being able to describe how to ride a bicycle or tie a shoelaces is not the same as being able to actually do that. You know, if you could learn how to play a game of golf by reading a book, I would be the world's best golf player. And I assure you, I'm I'm not even the best golf player in this building at the moment. Um, you know, th that linguistic ability is not the same as ability in the real world. And uh, actually, robotic AI is much, much harder than linguistic AI. So these things are really cool systems. It's wonderful technology. I think it does represent a breakthrough moment in artificial intelligence, but we're still a long way from the end of the road. Basically, they're blagging, essentially, without having the... the, the but but they can be very useful blaggers. They can, we can get them to do things. And I say, what we're going to see within a few years, in less than a few years, I think probably within a few months, is on, you know, in Microsoft Word, you'll be able to select a paragraph of text and just click on an option that says, rewrite this and make it nice. And it will rewrite it into grammatical English. Or you'll be able to select an option that says, shrink this text by 10%, and it will do that. Or extract the key bullet points from the text or turn this into a PowerPoint presentation and it will it will do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the frustrating things for AI researchers is that very soon people will forget that this is actually artificial intelligence, but behind the scenes it really is. So it's blagging. Uh, you know, I don't think it's there is real understanding or anything like that there. Uh, we don't yet know what that might look like, but that doesn't mean it isn't useful. It is going to be useful. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Honestly, uh, Professor Michael Waldridge, really, really great to have some expertise. And I think that's answered, certainly in my case, a huge number of questions I had. So thank you so much for joining us. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.